everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, I guess we'll probably start off just a little bit about how we met. Um, and, uh, you know, Jeanette and I met each other in 2008 when I was doing an exhibition um, with a Danish curator, Jakob Fabricius, in Denmark. Um, that was one of the first um, kind of investigations through art about the Danish colonial history. And we met at an artist talk, actually, after. And both of our works deal a lot with the coloniality. Um, in my context, it deals with the Virgin Islands. And um, you know, for Jeanette, it's dealing also with uh, <laughs> the Danish, I guess, almost inability to deal with their colonial history. Um, and our trajectory kind of went parallel across the seas for many years until this year when we finally decided to do a project together. Um, so I'll start off giving you a little bit of background of the, the project. Um, in 2014, um, a Danish researcher by the name of Hella Stenham, um, she, was really she was really interested in thinking about the upcoming centennial. This is a picture of the government house in St. Croix and it gives really good um, the polemics of the Virgin Islands and our identity. So this is our government house, and as you can see, we have three flags. Um, the, Virgin, the Virgin Islands flag is in the middle, flanked by the US flag and the Danish flag. Um, 2017 marks um, the transfer from uh, Denmark to the United States. Denmark was our longest colonizer of 250 years. Um, and our last is, of course, the United States. And that transfer occurred 100 years ago in 2017. So in 2014, Hella Stenham had started thinking about how can we commemorate this, uh, this upcoming transfer um, and, this, and this history. And she had thought a little bit about, um, she noticed that it was the artists that were kind of at the forefront of this conversation. And so she thought that perhaps an exhibition in two warehouses. Um, on the left, you see the warehouse in Denmark. That's where all the goods from the Virgin Islands came. And on the right, you see um, the warehouse in St. Croix. So her idea was to do a warehouse to warehouse uh, exhibition project and then to commission myself and Jeanette to do some kind of monument. Now that project fell apart for many reasons. Um, one of them is that this building in Denmark um, the Danish government closed it. It was functioning as a museum, not to the colonial history. It was actually a, a space that was housing a large collection of what they call the caste collection, of um, the, the royal caste collection, which is basically a lot of sculptures from antiquity, and they were copies of those major sculptures. And they decided to close the institution. And then on the Virgin Islands side, the director of um, this space, which is now owned by the U.S. government, um, the director of that space who was dealing with our project uh, left, and that position is yet to be filled. So, and finally, also because Hella Stenham is not of the art world, um, she found it difficult to kind of navigate such a large project and to be able to find the funding. Um, but her idea was to commission us to do um, a sculpture that dealt with this concept of mobility and we can interpret it any way we wanted. And so both Jeanette and myself had come up with some projects. Um, and I'll let Jeanette talk about her interpretation first of, of this idea. Hello everyone, um, my name is Jeanette and I'm based in Copenhagen. Uh, I have a Caribbean father, he's from Trinidad and Tobago, so that's my link to the diaspora. Just wanted to tell you. Um, yeah, I, um, in 2013, I was invited to do a live performance in Berlin, and I uh, came up with uh, this project called Whip It Good, which is um, a performance in which I whip uh, a canvas, and I invite the audience to take part, uh, to finish the painting, as I say. So uh, here, this, is, this image is from an exhibition of mine in Copenhagen. But here you see how it can, you know, how it looks when, I, when I'm doing my thing. And this is an image of people participating. It's a very um, 
It's a very engaging project, and I've been doing that in um, many places. Uh, it started out in Berlin, and I've been in South Africa, and in, in I've actually also done it here in Miami, and many places. <clears throat> But I also made a version of it inside of the warehouse in Copenhagen, the, West, the former West Indian warehouse that is now housing the Royal Cast Collection. Um, first of all, it was a great um, venue to do it because of the different histories or narratives that collide in there, the history of the transatlantic um, slave trade uh, and, and um, all the yeah, all the destruction and brutality that, ha that goes with that history. And then, now that it houses the royal cast collection with all, all these white plaster sculptures of the idealized uh, Western uh, canon of art. So I felt this is a good way and a good uh, place to, uh, to do my um, uh, performance. And I also made this image, as you see right here, um, that was a, a poster for my um, for um, a show of mine, where you see the, the the sculptures in the background. Here you see some of the other uh, sculptures that are there. There are around like two thousand five hundred sculptures in that place, which is a lot. Um, and um, I was in inspired by resistance movements, um, like. Um, this image, this iconic image of Huey Newton and the Black Panthers. So I was really inspired by that for my uh, poster. And um, also this made me um, think of <clears throat> this image, oops, this image was the inspiration also for the um, uh, m memorial sculpture that uh, I wanted to make outside of the building. Furthermore, um, when processing all these uh, ideas. Um, we were talking about how we could connect with the US Virgin Islands legacy of resistance. And um, uh, we wanted to connect to the history of the fire burn, of um, the legacy of Queen Mary, who was the leader of the labor revolt in 1878, together with um, three other uh, queens. And um, yeah, so, so it happened that the sculpture um, came into that trajectory of uh, resistance and, and um, uh, Queen Mary story. So um, across the Atlantic, as Jeanette was uh, developing her idea for the sculpture, um, my idea was um, I have an artist studio in um, Christiansted um, that I purchased in 2011 without knowing the full history of that space. Um, I learned later that it is a building that is a part of a larger neighborhood that's called Free Gut, which is where the first free black community in Christiansted was relegated to live by law. And it's kind of a forgotten history. There's a lot of abandoned buildings. My building was in very bad shape. And when I would sit outside, sometimes in between working, I would notice these coral stones. Um, and when I studied them more closely, one day I realized that they had very straight edges. And it sparked a memory of this history that I had heard that um, a lot of the foundations in the buildings of our historic town, which is a, a, you know, a, a colonial town from the 1600s, were they would send the enslaved Africans out into the ocean in low tide, tide to cut the coral out of the ocean and that formed the foundation of most of the buildings. However, on top of that is the bricks that they imported from Denmark. So a lot of times when you look at our town, you just see, um, you see a lot of the built heritage as European and you forget um, the labor that it took to get there. And what's also very interesting is that the way that you end up seeing or exposing the, the, the stones is when the buildings are in ruin. You know, when those buildings start to collapse is when you actually begin to start to see the stones because that's when they're normally plastered over. Um, it's rare to find an example like this, um, which is, you see the, the bricks on the left, it's the left, and, um, I'm sorry, the bricks on the right and the coral stone on the left, and I, oh, I love this image because it's really this interesting um, binding of these two histories. But my project, um, can you go back one? Yeah, just, it was pretty much to think about creating a, a plinth 
um, a, a sculpture that was a plin, thinking about this, that this is actually the foundation. I wanted to highlight that um, as the piece. And this, this is kind of a mock-up, and it's encased in plexiglass. Um, so as you can see, we both had very different interpretations of uh, mobility, but I think you know, one of the things is that they, they, they are both kind of linking this diasporic resistance, whether it be from the Black Panthers or to this image of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, which interestingly enough is also started by women. Um, to even here, um, this idea of the sanitation workers strike in 1968. Um, and this is here another image to give you a little bit of an idea of who Queen Mary was in and is in the imaginary of uh, Virgin Islanders. Um, she is our most iconic figure. Um, I, we have a couple people from the VI who would probably agree. <laughs> we sing songs about her as children. Um, there is a highway named after her. Um, she's kind of like the mother of, of our nation. Um, I have an image here that I wanted to show that's kind of interesting because up until very recently, um, when a, uh, a Virgin Islands historian um, went to Denmark. A lot of people, a lot of you wouldn't wouldn't know this, but um, when Denmark sold us to the United States, they took everything with them. They took all of their records, um, all their documents, all the photographs. Um, they even took things that were not theirs, like our um, our indigenous artifacts um, from the Taino people. So what that created was that in the Virgin Islands, we are people with, that have had to construct a memory without records. Um, and so in the mythology of the Fireburn, most of us always imagined that there were three, this iconic three queens of the Fireburn. And it was only until about, um, maybe about 10 years ago that Wayne James, a historian, when he went to Denmark himself to go and look at the records that we realized that there were four, and I think, so these are the, their four prison records of the women. They were brought to Denmark. Um, they were sentenced to death um, for their participation in what was the largest labor revolt in the Danish kingdom at the time, because you know Denmark was a very large kingdom. Uh, we think of it as a very small country, but at that time it was Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Greenland, and parts of Germany. Um, and so it's, you know, thinking about that, their, their their amazing courage, as we think about the previous <laughs> um, lecture with Maya Angelou, you know, that these women who were all the, also mothers, um, you know, the records give us some clue and information about them. But um, I think that's, it's, it's very inspiring for both me and Jeanette to want to honor and embody these women. <clears throat> uh, here's another image just thinking about this kind of iconic three queens, which are the three, um, women who started Black Lives Matter, Opal Tometi, Patrice Cullors, and Alicia Garza. Um, so as you can see, we had these you know, two separate projects across the pond that were unfunded and just ideas. And about a year and a half ago, Jeanette was, you know, she actually continued with her idea and she was able to raise a lot of money um, to, to raise the sculpture of Queen Mary. Um, and then earlier this year, she invited me to be a collaborator on the project. And this is kind of a funny part of the story because, you know, sometimes we, it's lost in translation. So she's telling me over Skype, I want you to collaborate. And I thought, um, of course, this makes perfect sense. I have a plinth, you have a figure, we can combine them, this is perfect. And it was when I got to Denmark where she said, um, okay, well, we're gonna meet the body scan person so that we can do the, and I went, what? I didn't realize I had agreed to also join her on top of the plinth. <laughs> but, um, and at the beginning, I wasn't sure how to really feel about that. But, um, so this actually is an image, um, and I'll tell you how I feel about it a little bit later, <laughs> because I, I think it's actually a really significant part of the piece, but, um, when I, I think this is in March earlier this year, we had, um, these 3D body scan people, and I'll let Jeanette actually talk a little bit about that while, while we show you a little bit of the process. Oh, yeah. So this is high technology. Um, yeah, we were both body scanned, and the idea was um, 
to, uh, since this is a bridging project, you know, we're bridging our nations, our narratives, and our bodies, and our spirits. Um, so, uh, so the body scan was to, um, to scan our bodies and to create this new woman out of our two bodies. So the, yeah, so the, the sculpture, um, the, the queen in the, in the chair would be, um, yeah, um, a fusion between, a hybrid between Levon and I. Um, and uh, this is some of the raw material. It's a very, very interesting and very fascinating process that, you know, you can just scan something. It's not even a photography. It's like scanning. I don't know how it works, but it's very fascinating. So this is how it comes in in the, in the computer when he takes, when he uploads what he's just scanned. And these images are the two of us. I mean, this is Levon and this is me. And the guy who scanned it, he would work on it and create this new woman because also we don't know what Queen Mary looks like. So this is an opportunity, like I said before, to create this new woman, this future woman, talking about the past and the future, and very Afro-futuristic, Afro actually, in many ways. Okay, so this is also a very uh, early um, point in the process. You can see she has four arms, and uh, you know the, the shoulders are not right. But I, I really love this image because it, ha it has so much um, fierceness in it and it's orange and it talks to the fire burn and <laughs> it, it's really a nice image, I think. Um, but of course it has been uh, worked on a lot more and uh, now she has her two arms and two legs and <laughs> um, this is, um, what is this? Oh yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so. Again, this is the image of, maybe you can, oh no, we can see him. This is the image of the warehouse in Copenhagen, the former West Indian warehouse. And outside of that building you see on, on the left-hand side, you see this huge sculpture of um, the iconic uh, Michelangelo's David, which is, of course, a copy that is located right there. And it kind of, you know, it misses something, I think. So that's why I, I wanted to make, um, a sculpture and to place um, a sculpture of a big black female on the opposite side, just to kind of, you know, talk to that other history. And also, it's really, um, it's obvious that in Denmark and maybe many places, uh, most of the sculptures that are around the cities uh, of men, you know, on horses, or, you know, that's in, in Copenhagen is 80, or in Denmark, I think it's 80, 80, uh, 98 percent that are um, male statues. So we wanted to make, uh, we wanted to challenge that narrative and uh, create this huge, it's like two story, like as you can see, it's, it's really big. Um, we wanted to challenge that by creating Queen Mary. Um, and also I forgot to say before that in this image, because it was inspired by the image that was taken inside, the photo that was taken inside with the whip, I have the whip here. This is a very early stage in the, in the process. But we had to, we, we uh, decided to, of course, to, to uh, change that because Queen Mary would never hold a whip. She had her um, cane bill and uh, a torch. So that's what is now, you know, um, that's what, what she is when you go and see it uh, down at, uh, downstairs, or you can also see it here. Um, that's the way she would have done it, of course. So, so that is also a way, you know, that, that's in the process. It, it changes all the time. Um, I wanted to speak a little bit also to the symbols that she has in her hand. Um, you know, I, I have a, a series of work that I do that's called Cuts and Burns. And if you think about it, uh, cutting and burning are one of the two most significant tools of colonization of a uh, plantation. If you arrive to an island and you want to turn it into some kind of plantation, how are you going to do that? Um, you're going to slash and burn it. Um, so that's really a tool of the colonizers, which ends up becoming a tool of the Africans who are rebelling against that same system, from the Haitian Revolution to our own fire bond. Um, what they were able to do with it was to use the same cane bill or machete that they were toiling with and, and use fire. Um, and so that was important to kind of have those as symbols um, as, she's, as she's sitting. 
Um, I want, we're going to show also one of the first uh, prototypes that were printed. This is actually in the Workers Museum in Denmark, uh, which is significant because, um, as we mentioned before, um, when you think about the larger context of Danish history, she was the leader of one of the largest labor revolts um, in Denmark, or in the Danish Empire. Um, mm -hmm. So as we're going along this project, um, we had to import two tons of <laughs> uh, coral to Denmark, which is kind of really interesting also when you're thinking about the fact that um, you know, all of these goods from the colonies were being sent to Denmark. So here we are sending back um, this kind of another visibilization of the labor of these Africans that their hands had touched. Um, however, when me and my studio system, when we were collecting a lot of the stones, we did not have time to clean them when we sent them because we were rushing. Because uh, it took, you know, probably what, two months for the stones to get to Denmark. So here we are, we, and with other people, it wasn't just Jean and myself, um, cleaning the stones and prepping them. Um, we're currently using a fabricator in Denmark called the Wow Factory, and one of the ways that they are uh, doing the sculpture is by printing it, but in the inverse. Um, they're milling it out of polystyrene, which is a type of styrofoam, and then it's gonna be coated and painted. Um, we can also see here, you can get a sense of the scale of, uh, of the piece. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, let me just see here. Well, of course you can imagine a project like this has had many challenges. Um, some of the challenges, of course, have been uh, funding. Uh, you know, although we, Jeanette, with her amazing, <laughs> amazing skills, this is very rare for an artist to be able to raise that kind of money to do a project. And we're, you know, it's, it's very significant because it's not a commission project. A lot of public art projects come out of institutions. It's actually the inverse where we have artists who are pushing into and reclaiming the public space. Um, but that also has presented a challenge because although we have a temporary permission to put the sculpture in front of the, the warehouse, it is the Danish government under, in a very clandestine manner, is trying to sell that building, which in many other places it would be unheard of to sell a building that's that significant to their history, but they're currently trying to sell it. Um, and so the, what, and, and we're having challenges finding an institution who's going to take care of the sculpture. I mean, imagine we just created a two-story baby together <laughs> that we're gonna have to find a way to take care of for the rest of our lives. Um, so what we're hoping is that an institution will, how, you know, will take care of it, which is in some ways like, you know, it's challenging Danish institutions to really like take, take hold of this history and, and pay attention to it. But on the other hand, it's presented actually a really interesting strategy for us when we go back to this idea of mobility, because if the sculpture has to constantly move, it's forcing wherever it moves to that area to have to re-engage with the history and it will have a new context depending on where it moves to. So that's still a part of our project that's in flux. Um, it, will, it will be at the warehouse until they ask us to move it. Um, maybe, I think Jeanette, maybe we'll talk a little bit about the, who the funders are and, um, and then we'll I'll talk a little bit more about the title. Yeah, um, as you mentioned, it has been a great challenge to, uh, to find uh, support, financial support. But however, we found uh, money in um, a foundation that was dedicated to projects around the centennial um, last year, or this year, sorry, it's almost done. Um, and also there was another foundation, uh, the Beckett Foundation, that somehow has um, connection to the U.S. Virgin Islands, so they were very keen on supporting us and also to really to have a permanent um, uh, sculpture. So you know we have their support, and that's really really nice, and we appreciate it very much. Um, and also, actually, the the the, the Royal Cast Collection slash the West Indian Warehouse uh, belongs to um, the National Gallery of uh, Denmark. And they are, 
they support us because they gave us the permission to have it temporarily. And uh, you know, now that they see that we are really working on this and we get we get some attention, we actually we got a lot of attention in Denmark uh, around this. So now they are kind of open opening up to support us also, and maybe it turns out that they would, you know, I don't know. We we can never we we, we can never know, but they actually they want to help us promoting it and um, you know be supportive. So um, that's that's great. But yeah, I just want to <clears throat> emphasize that doing this, um, yeah, it's it's really like reclaiming or claiming some space, just like. Um, like the, the queens did in, a, in another way. And I, I really feel it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a huge challenge, but it's also really something that is so needed in Denmark because, um, yeah, the, the, the um, awareness and the consciousness around uh, colonial issues is completely lacking. Uh, so this is, this is the first memorial from a Danish hand and from, yeah, from a Danish hand that will be, um, visible in, in Denmark and uh, a lot of people don't know their own history so this is really important. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about also the process of engagement um, that we've done throughout the way. Um, you know we've had forums and talks like this both in Denmark and in St. Croix and it, it was they were very interesting because of course you know public art is not just about the sculpture it's it's engaging um, in some ways this this sculpture is just an artifact of the larger process and conversation um, and when we had the the engagement at St. Croix it was really revealing because as you can imagine Kujans have a I mean we burned down part of our whole island, both we took our own freedom by doing it in 1848, and then in, you know, 30 years later, here we are burning down stuff again, <laughs> because, so you can imagine we have a very fiery community, and there was a lot of you know, questions about what does that mean to take our most prized heroine and bring her to Denmark, um, especially in the context of the centennial, because the Danish Prime Ministers came on March 31st to both to the Virgin Islands. Um, there was a large anticipation of whether or not an apology would be granted. And during his speech, he was very, he had a, um, an attitude of sh shame, you know, and understanding that what happened was wrong. And there was a build up to the point where a lot of us thought that he would issue an apology because he talked about how it was unforgivable and what happened was horrible. And then there was a pivot. Um, and how he pivoted was by talking about the fact that how we should deal with our future is by, 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 by thinking about the, the true heroines and the true heroes like Queen Mary, and he named her. And so I think that's really, it was an interesting, it was an interesting way for the Danish government to avoid actually giving an apology. Um, but of course, it problematizes this idea when the Danish Prime Minister talks about almost maybe possibly cannibalizing our heroes, and here we are bringing, um, bringing her to Denmark. So that, was, that, that actually came up in some of the conversations in St. Croix, in addition to many things. Um, one of them also being this idea of her, the way that she's being depicted. Um, in our imaginary, I think you saw an earlier image of her in a painting and she's like fierce with all these people around her. We imagine Queen Mary dynamic and active. And this image of her um, really does speak also to this European tradition of queendom. You know, she's kind of, it looks like she's sitting on a throne in some ways. And so there were questions around that because queen, the queens in, the, in the, the African diaspora and in the Caribbean are not in a European tradition. You are not born a queen. You are conferred that title because the community gives you that title, because you are a leader in the community. Um, and I think what's interesting is that this very iconic um, peacock chair that is you know, also a part of the colonial trade, we, it's, you know, um, it's also a very domestic object that you see throughout. Uh, especially in the Caribbean, I, so many, I mean, actually even my, my studio had one when I purchased, purchased it, it was left there. Um, 
it's also this, you know, it's, it's a very domestic object. It's, it's not a throne that no one else can access. I mean, many of us have these in our homes or have sat in them. So it's really, you know, thinking about Queen Mary um, as, as a laborer, as, as one of us. And so one of the things that happened, um, I'm giving you guys all the backstories here, but um, there, there also was a question, of course, about us. Well, first it was with Jeanette. How could she make her image in Queen Mary? Um, and then when the two of us decided to do it, it was still that question of, so is this a self-portrait? Like, wh why, who are you, actually, <laughs> to use your image as Queen Mary? And the sculpture originally had the title Queen Mary Spirit because it isn't just about her as a historical figure, it's thinking about the spirit of resistance. Um, and then also intertwining all these narratives and these histories. But we chose to, to change the title to I Am Queen Mary to really um, answer that question head on about us embodying her and what that means to embody this narrative and this, and this woman and these histories. And some of the things that we thought about were, um, you know, we had shown an image earlier of the I Am A Man placard, which you know, in that context was definitely these men calling into presence of their humanity. And we thought also about, if a lot of you have seen the movie by Spike Lee, where there's, uh, of Malcolm X, there's a scene just before Nelson Mandela speaks where there's a bunch of children that actually say, I am Malcolm X, and it's all these children that repeat that. And I was all, you know, I lived in Cuba, I went to, to art school there, and a, a lot of the children have to also say seremos como el Che, which is we will be like Che. You know, kind of thinking about how can we align ourselves with, with, with our, our heroes. And so the sculpture very much you know, not only challenges this idea of us embodying, having the audacity to take that throne um, and to, to figure out what that means for us to embody her, but it also speaks to these histories. And it also is you know, very much in the African tradition of call and response because when you see the sculpture, the first thing you're gonna wonder is who is she? And she answers that question by telling you. She says, I am, you know, I am Queen Mary. And she's calling into presence not only her humanity and herself, but also all the history and the narratives that she comes with. But of course, imagine in Denmark, you know, what does that mean for a white Dane to have to say that as well? So it, it makes, it makes, them have to question what is my relationship to this history and this woman by when they say I, I am Queen Mary. Um, it's, uh, it's been, um, I think, uh, so, so here we are in December now, actually, and the sculpture is going up on March 31st. We've, you know, part of our challenges also have been, you know, a lot, there's so many things, but first, you know, obviously to, to work together with, with someone else has been really interesting. I just came off of a three month residency and that was the first time that Jeanette and I really had a chance to really solidify our, our, our partnership um, because, you know, working on a project from so far away was, was, was also one of the challenges. Um, and there was a turning point moment uh, in our collaboration because we were really pushing for the sculpture to happen on October 1st um, because that is the date that the fire burn occurred. It was um, every year um, the plantations pretty much had the workers on lockdown on a plantation for a year and every year you would have to be transferred to it. You would have to sign your contract. So that was the contract date. So that was the day that the workers took as an opportunity to make demands that no, we want to raise, we don't, we don't like this, et cetera. And that was how the fire burn started um, in terms of revolting on that day. So for us, that was a very important day. But as we came closer, the corals were somewhere in the Atlantic. <laughs> um, and we were just pushing, pushing to try to have the sculpture anyway. And at one point we had even thought that we would still have the sculpture and that we would create a plinth that was kind of empty and put the corals in when they came. It sounds crazy, but that's, that's what we thought because we were so single, like just willing this thing. And it was a turning point for both of us. I mean, <laughs> Jeanette, I think, you know, you had your moment of uh, <laughs> a freak out moment. Um, and, and I did as well, because I think one of the things that we realized was that the corals 
Although it, there's a lot of attention, of course, on the figure of Queen Mary, the corals are the soul of the piece. And we really had to think, like, what are we saying if we were going to put up the, the sculpture without the, 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 that part of it? And it was also a moment that the both of us also realized that um, the spirituality in the project. Um, we were called to do this project. Um, you know, when we think about the trajectory of meeting in 2008, or even how I met, how I ended up in Denmark by meeting a, a Danish curator on the streets of Havana in 2006, um, and just how we, we have been called to do this project. That's, that's the best way that we could say that, that the ancestors have definitely wanted their voices to be heard, and they've been, they called us to get to that project. And I think that was a turning point where we both really had to acknowledge that. Um, through that possibility of the absence of the, of the, of the coral is when I think we, we realized that. Um, and so when we decided to postpone the sculpture, it helped us to solidify the importance of making sure it was done right. You can't spend, and you know, then the hurricane also devastated many islands, but including the Virgin Islands, and just thinking about all those resources going up into a monument, and we just really wanted to make sure it was done right. So we've now postponed it to March 31st, um, which I think now is, again, it's, it's the perfect date because there was a lot of attention in the centennial year about the colonial history. Um, and a lot of people wondered, well, what's gonna happen after? And so by doing it on March 31st in 2018, it helps to kind of extend the conversation beyond the centennial year and to, and to hopefully um, you know, get people to continue to think about what, what does it mean to kind of memorialize this type of history and how can we continue to engage in conversations about decolonial practices and how art can do that. Um, yeah, so I don't know, maybe Jeanette wants to say anything else, but we're very open to questions. Yeah, yeah, well, I think you said everything um, yeah it's, it's just that um, in, yeah in a, from a Danish point of view and from a, yeah from my perspective um, to do it into I was very keen on doing it this year because of the centennial but I just think it's really nice that we uh, we do it next year because we just scratched the surface and this is really something that will make the Danes um, uh, that will confront the Danes and and have them really you know uh, yeah being confronted with their own past. So hopefully this will be a, a manifestation that will last and, and give consciousness to, to, uh, yeah, to the Danes and the rest of the world. Because a lot of people even don't know that the Danes were colonizers for so long. So um, yeah, that's it. This is actually the first time that we've presented the project um, outside of the Danish Virgin Islands context. And it speaks to this idea of what was absent in the centennial year. Because if you think about it, the centennial really should have been a conversation about 100 years of us being connected to the United States. And what does that mean for us with our continuing relationship with the United States? But instead, it really was focused more backward. And there were a lot of questions, people had a lot of questions about what not, you know, what does that mean? Why are we still, I mean, even if you saw that early image, why do we still have the Danish flag on our government house? Um, there's since, there's, and I think it's the same reason why it's important for, in Scandinavia, for them to grapple with their colonial history, because if they can't do that, they can't deal with the, the persistent racism and treatment of immigrants today, because it is connected to that history. Um, and I think in some ways for us as Virgin Islanders, uh, it's, it's been a challenge for us to really think about our relationship with the United States. I think that's part of the reason the conversation is still focusing backwards and not, not present and forwards. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, I'll actually back up a little bit before I answer it. So in 
March of this year, I had a solo show in, in Copenhagen and it got a lot of attention, um, but in a way that was a little bit surprising to me, which helps to answer your question. So I was interviewed by the Politiken, which is kind of like maybe the version of a New York Times or something like that. And uh, after a very engaging and amazing interview with the journalist, we, she of course asked me about the Danish debate and the way they frame it is whether or not they should give an apology. And for us in the Virgin Islands, that's not a debate. That's obvious that we should be given an apology. So I was really surprised to see that in the coverage of my show, the title of the article said, St. Croix Artist says all Danes should give an apology. And um, yeah, I got dozens and dozens of emails. Um, phone, you know, I got my first hate mail written about me. I got... Um, people who came to the exhibition to hug me, to offer apologies. And it was very interesting because my body became a space of atonement and it was actually in one of our talks in Denmark that we realized that we we're also creating a space of atonement by creating this sculpture where we're embodying this history uh, physically. Um, so that's one way I think that the sculpture can create a kind of a space of atonement. But um, the other thing is really in terms of the conversation, you can't have of reparative discourse if you don't even know the history, right? So the first thing is to be able to open up an honest dialogue about what happened. We have not done that. We, you know, in the Virgin Islands, we're talking over here and Danes are talking over here. There hasn't really been, you know, when we talk about our shared histories, we go, what, what have we shared? <laughs> you know, in terms of that real um, conversation about what happened. Um, the people who were me, I mean, just, you know, we, I, I make comments like, um, I think Danes don't understand that the, the Virgin Islands, it's like living in a ruin of a concentration camp. There were 250 plantations on St. Croix alone and there are ruins that you could see from any point, from on the beach to your backyard to Sunny Isles, our shopping center, you see remnants, physical remnants everywhere. So it impacts us a lot in our, like this kind of symbolic violence, but you know, in, in Denmark, they don't, they, they were able to really forget about us because we're actually one of the only former colonies in the Caribbean, uh, former European colonies that don't speak the language of our colonizer. And that happened because the Danes always outsourced their, they were like the original outsourcers of their colonial empire. They hired men from Great Britain. Um, but in terms of going back to this idea of how does the, the sculpture um, uh, t interact with the, a, re a reparations dialogue, it's first in creating a physical space for atonement, but then also really having this dialogue about, about the history and what happened. That has to happen before you start talking about any, um, any uh, like physical, monetary, or anything like that. You have to first talk about what happened yeah. Yeah. Um, I also think um, something that has to be mentioned is, of course, um, creating this and putting up this statue uh, right now, where there's so much going on in the states, where they are te tearing down statues, is also really relevant and very because, uh, of course, it, this is now the U.S. Virgin Islands. It's a it's it's U.S. territory, so it's also part of the American history and. Um, so Queen Mary is also part of the, yeah, the American history. And to do that is really interesting and very, very important, an important perspective also that we actually, yeah, putting up something while a lot of things are being tearing down. There's something going on right now. And um, I think that's, yeah, I just wanted to mention that. Something about consciousness and understanding and a will to change. Of course, we have so much challenge still. I mean, that it's getting worse and worse. Uh, but there's some, there's some power that's happening on the other side, I think. Um, I just want to also talk about that experience about what happened with the journalist. So she, um, in the middle of the interview, she also apologized for slavery, um, which was interesting. I never had anybody, she, and she asked me, she's like, how do you feel? <laughs> and I just, said, I actually never had anybody do that before, so I didn't know how to feel, but I've now had time to think about it. And um, 
I've actually uh, developed a talk around that experience because um, that I call Seeing Sorry, and it's about you know, the visuality of a repetitive dif discourse. And the reason why I say seeing as opposed to saying sorry is because saying centers it on the subject that is saying the apologizing, but seeing centers it on the per person and the, and the subject that is receiving the apology. And that's actually who matters in this conversation. It's not so much about what Danes are saying, feeling, or doing. It's how we interpret what they're doing. How we see, are they doing enough to make up for what they did to us? It, it's centering us and how we feel about it. Because for example, when the Danish Prime Minister came, they did do something. They offered 10 scholarships of one semester that ended in five, up to five years for young people in college. Um, and a lot of people were very excited about, whoa, it's education, it's young people, but really what does that do to give a 20-year-old three months in Denmark? What does that do? Does that make up for 250 years of exploitation? No. It might have made Danes feel nice to say that they gave us something, but we as Virgin Islanders don't see a shift or a change. And I say it's something like this, like let's say you had $100 and you gave me a dollar. That doesn't do much. It doesn't shift anything. But if you get, had to give me 40 of your 100 or 50 of your 100, then now all of a sudden your economics have to change. It actually makes a, 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 a systemic shift in how you have to move. And so to me, that's what true reparations is about. It, it has to be more of a systemic shift that you have to be altered enough. Um, and so yeah, I, I think, I mean, obviously the sculpture is only the beginning in that. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's the beginning in, in raising those questions and conversations and, and issues. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we have spoken about it, of course. And uh, first of all, of course, there will be um, what do you call it? Uh, a plaid where you know we will make it, give information about what it's about. But I, but of course, we will also make sure to to tour and to to give talks about it. And uh, hopefully, uh, it will be part of um, school material. And um, yeah. We've been thinking about that, uh, and we, we have to do that, of course. We have to implement it somehow, and to make, um, yeah, debates. And, and we also wanted to um, engage with um, the Danish public about it. So we made um, a talk, a small talk, of, well, not a small, but a, a small talk, but uh, uh, yeah, we had a talk on the, the 1st of October last year, of this year, sorry, um, and um, yeah, to, to to open up for discussion as we as we did in um, in in Saint Croix, yeah. But I think we will have to have more of that, and also in Saint Croix, we'll have to really get out there and and talk about it. Um, there were in the in Saint Croix. There was because of the lack of dialogue between 
Um, it was interesting because by the time that we brought the sculpture to the audience, um, Crusians in some ways felt that they wanted to have a say in the design. So they were disappointed and saw it as a further um, way that they've been cut out of the conversation. That's part of how they almost interpreted it. Um, and of course, you know, sculptures have many ways that they are, they come into fruition and a lot of times, even though they may get input from publics, it's still an artist's vision. Um, and there was also this, uh, this questioning of, of her possibly being presented as a European queen. Um, and that raised a really interesting conversation about um, this, you know, this kind of uh, contesting of European and African feminine femininity. Um, you know, there's a, a little known, you know, Queen Mary, when she returned to the Virgin Islands, she was a legend in, in her lifetime. Um, and there's a story about her during the fire burn, forcing a white woman to fan her because, you know, you see many images where, you know, Africans, that was one of the servile roles that they had to fan Europeans. And so they say that during the fire burn that she made a European, uh, a Danish woman fan her. So there, there's a song, a, a Cariso song, where it, it's called Fan Me, um, kind of her taking, about Queen Mary, taking that, taking that power back. And so we kind of talked a little bit about that, that it actually was very much in a part of uh, African Caribbean resistance strategies to take European models of things and kind of flip them, um, whether it be dance, language, et cetera. And so here we are, you know, I think it would be very much of Queen Mary to say like, oh, that's your throne? This is my throne, right? I, I tuck in it. <laughs> so, um, but I, I, in Denmark, you know, a lot of the spaces that we have presented the sculpture in, there's really profound ignorance. So they, it's almost like how do you have an, in, you can't have an informed opinion about something you don't know a lot about. So what, it, what the sculpture functions in Denmark is to begin the conversation about, about this history. You know, it, it just makes people so aware of how much they don't know, they would like to know more, but of course, in the same way that, you know, that article that I started getting hate mail, um, we're anticipating that we probably, that, you know, it's, it's pretty much 100% guaranteed that the sculpture will be defaced. Um, I mean, even the Little Mermaid, which is, you know, their iconic sculpture has been defaced several times. So, um, you know, we, we're, <laughs> at least we've been told that. Everybody's like, just be prepared. They're gonna deface your sculpture, okay? Um, <laughs> um, so we're, you know, but I, I think, I think absolutely, you know, that strategy of how, although we are, we're like, we are working in that traditional European tradition of creating monuments and at the same time, how can we invert that? I mean, I think that that's so much a part of, a, you know, this African Caribbean resistance strategy, taking some things that are, are very, uh, in the European tradition and trying to transform it. And so I think one of the ways that, one of the ways that we've been doing that is seeing this process of having the engagements and the dialogues and the conversations. And, you know, that is kind of the next stage of our project of how do we continue to activate it? And that's what we're, you know, that's really what we're gonna be thinking about in the next coming months and year, really. Yeah. There's one um, dimension that we didn't mention at all. And that is that um, the location is right next to the Queen's castle. We, you know, we have a queen in Denmark. Uh, her name is Margaret, um, and we met her actually, and we told her there's a new queen coming to town. <laughs> so, but her, her son, um, the crown prince, his wife is called Mary. So that is also something that, will, that goes into this story that you know, will in some way resonate with the Danes. You know, they will really, oh, wow, there's, a, you know, there's a, a link between this in some, in some ways. So I think that is something, of course, that is also, she will be the queen, be the queen like when, when Margaret dies and her son takes over, she will be the queen, so there'll be two Marys in that area. So that's really something that can open up for, you know, knowledge of the Danes also, and that's, of course, something that we have been thinking into the project. It has been a challenge, you know, um, 
because we didn't know what would happen to the building and um, to try to get in touch with or to have, you know, to get to speak with the people who actually owns that space has been uh, quite some, you know, quite a lot of work. And uh, still we don't, we, yeah, we, we got the, the director of the National Gallery, um, we got his um, promise that we can have it temporarily, and, uh, but we don't know for how long. And, um, and, and, you know, every time I'm trying to ask, you know, who can we, who can we ask to, you know, to get some kind of confirmation, nobody knows. It's like, okay, you, you try to ask this person, and then I ask this person, then it, it takes me, it takes them like four months to give me an answer, and then I have to ask someone else, and you know, it's all these things, you never know who is in charge of it, so right now, I just gave up, and I'm like, okay, we have it temporarily, and hopefully when it's up there, someone will take over and say, okay, we want it <laughs> permanently. Maybe not there, but somewhere else, or you know, it's... Yeah, 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 that was... You know, I like I like the fact too. Um, the only thing I just can't <laughs> I just can't um, uh, imagine is how to raise money to move her. You know, it's like oh my God, it's just that's that's really uh, a hurdle. But uh, I like the fact that she could be traveling. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? All right, well, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Mikael, for allowing us to do this. We appreciate it very much. Yeah.